thank you to everyone for joining us this afternoon and welcome to the Shine webinar series. This is the third in the, the Shine webinar series and we're delighted to have Professor Helen Minnis with us as our special guest this afternoon. Um, so we, uh, Professor Minnis is uh, a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry at the University of Glasgow working within the mental uh, health and well-being department within the Institute of, of Health and Wellbeing. So we're delighted that she's agreed to share her expertise with us this afternoon. Um, Professor Minnis has a particular research focus on attachment disorders, adverse childhood experiences, and also interventions for maltreated young children in foster care. So a wealth of um, expertise there to share. So the focus or the title of this webinar is attachment difficulties, stress at home, stress at school. And so just before um, I hand over to Helen, a couple of housekeeping um, bits and pieces before we start. So very warm welcome to all 122 of you. Um, that's a fantastic um, participation rate. It's definitely a record for us. So thank you very much for joining and especially on such a, a sunny afternoon as well. So really warm welcome to you all. So without further delay, I'm delighted to hand over to Helen. Thank you very much, Don. And thank you very much to our audience. Um, it really is an honour that we've got so many of you on such a lovely afternoon. I'm kind of hoping that maybe one or two of you are sitting in the garden under an umbrella with a nice <laughs> cool drink. <laughs> so, I am going to talk about attachment, but I'm going to start off talking about stress. So we all need a little bit of stress because if you don't have any stress, then you're going to be like Garfield, just sitting there with the remote control and not really achieving very much. But you want to have the right amount of stress. So this was a, one of the things that stuck in my mind when I was a medical student. It's called the yertz dodson curve and it really made a lot of sense to me because what it shows us is that when our stress levels are too low, like Garfield's there, we've got low performance. You know, we're going to be if we're really unstressed. We're going to be half asleep and bored and we need to kind of arouse ourselves a bit in order to start seeing improvements in our function. You know, that feeling when you've got to get your kids up and going in the morning. Very difficult sometimes on lockdown. And then you get to a kind of optimal performance phase. And it's a bit of a plateau where you're on, in that state of flow and you're just ready for being productive. But if your stress levels get higher than that, and we all have experienced this, then your performance starts to, to fall that horrible feeling when you know you studied for an exam and you're in the exam and you've got it already but the adrenaline starts flowing and suddenly you can't remember anything and if it gets just too much then we really start to break down and, and burn out so thinking about children in the classroom their optimal performance when they've got a bit of stress going that peer pressure they can be happy, exhilarated, optimistic, full of life, ready to learn. But just over the edge of that yertz dodson curve, and they can be terrified, exhausted, hopeless, humiliated, and not really taking anything in. And we've all experienced that. My husband used to teach in the east end of Glasgow and he taught maths, which you know many of uh, your pupils are, are not great fans of necessarily, but there was um, a young person really um, disrupting things for everyone else. And uh, my, my husband, who at the time was a, a probationary teacher, asked for his head of department to come in and, and, and help. And the, the head of department um, got really um, angry with this young man and, and said, I'll make your life a misery. And the young man turned around and said, my life already is a misery. 
And you will all, I'm sure, if your teachers have experienced that horrible moment when you realise that a young person, a child or a young person is bringing all sorts of things from their home life into the classroom. And Scotland's been a fantastic um, place um, over the last few years for thinking about adverse childhood experiences. Um, Nicola Sturgeon and, and other policymakers have been talking about trying to make Scotland an ace-aware nation. ACEs are adverse childhood experiences, and this term was coined by Vincent Thwaiti and colleagues from a big study that was done with people in America signed up to the, the Kaiser Permanente Insurance Company. And what they did, and this is about 20 years ago now, was they asked um, adults to fill in a short questionnaire um, and basically telling um, whether they'd experienced any of these 10 ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. On this side of the graph, you've got the typical five that we think about, abuse and neglect, physical abuse and neglect, emotional abuse and neglect, and sexual abuse. But they also looked at uh, what they called household dysfunction. And so if you look on the other side of the diagram here, these are things that are actually really quite common. So having a parent with a mental health problem, some of them are common. Actually, having an incarcerated relative, someone in prison, is not that common. Um, domestic abuse is, is unfortunately not rare. Having a parent with an alcohol or drug problem, similar. And divorce is very common. So clearly, having one or two ACEs isn't abnormal. And in fact, in the population, it's very, very common. Many, many of us will have had one, two, three, four of these. Um, that doesn't seem to be a major problem. But what those studies showed, and there have been hundreds of publications that have come out of those studies, is that there are dose response um, relationships between the number of ACEs and your risk of negative outcomes. So this slide is something that is old news. This has been known for decades. If you've had many adverse life events in childhood, then you're at increased risk of depression. So here you can see if you've had four or more ACEs, five or more ACEs, sorry, then you're at five times the risk of being depressed in adult life. But this was a shock. So they also showed that if you've had seven or eight ACEs, then you're at more than three times the risk of heart disease. Now this, and other findings about um, other types of cardiovascular events, um, suicidality, cancers as well. This really woke up the medical and psychiatric um, communities. Well, the medical and scientific communities actually. And there's been an enormous um, amount of research trying to understand these relationships since. So um, as Don mentioned, I work um, and in research with abused and neglected children. And I think about this as the load that the child's carrying, the ACEs load. And the bigger the child's load, the higher their health risk across the lifespan. But, and this is really important, you mustn't forget resilience because about half of the children in, um, who've experienced abuse and neglect, the most severe ACEs, have mental health problems in childhood. But that means that another half don't have mental health problems in childhood. And what we really don't understand yet is why some children um, seem to be able to cope even with a very high ACE load. And you know, we've got more than 100 people on the, the webinar today and within us, I'm sure there are some of us who've experienced many, many ACEs, eight, nine, 10, um, and are functioning fine. That is one of science's biggest conundrums. Um, but don't forget it, because it's so important not to give the child a message that just because they've had terrible things happen, that terrible things are going to happen because many children are resilient. But scientists and clinicians really think that our money should be on the stress response system. And this is a quite complex graph. Don't worry about it. I'll talk you through it. But the hypothalamic 
pituitary axis, the HPA axis, governs both our stress responses and our immune system. So it links part of the brain, the, the, the central brain here, and also um, the anterior pituitary gland, which is just above your nose and um, still within the, the skull. And then there are glands at the top of the kidneys. So this is a real brain body um, system. And what science seems to be saying is that um, we are actually quite adapted to deal with a stressful early environment. Our, our physiology is kind of made for that. Um, and so we, we adapt our HPA axis to situations of high stress. But we think that some forms of adaptation, or perhaps it's, it's whether you have to adapt over long periods, and we don't exactly know how this works, but sometimes these adaptations become maladaptive over time, and they seem to be linked to the development of psychiatric disorders. In, and this can also be in situations of low stress. We know that there is a very sensitive diurnal pattern to secretion of cortisol. So cortisol is one of the main stress hormones. Um, and we don't end up with this lovely sensitive kind of thermostat until about school age. And anyone that has toddlers will know that they need a lot of help with their stress. So this is a bit of a kind of sleep-wake thing in the sense that when you're waking up in the morning, you're just going up towards your peak of cortisol secretion. I think that's always when you need your coffee in the morning. And then your cortisol levels tend to fall towards um, the middle of the day and then later in the day, and they get to a nadir at night, and then they start coming up again overnight. So that's your kind of alarm clock, um, um, the, the kind of alarm clock function of cortisol. But it seems to have another function, which is a stress hormone, a kind of acute stress hormone. So, you know, those um, among you who are teachers, you, you'll know the stress of an HMI inspection. And if you're, um, if you're a pupil, you'll know it's exams. Or for any of us, it could be, God forbid, a car accident. But if you have a really big stress, then whatever part of the day um, you're at in that cycle, you'll have a peak of cortisol. Um, there's actually, Megan Gunner has done a lot of this research and uh, you, can, you can look up her research, but what she's shown is that um, in primates, including humans, parental care buffers a child's stress responses so they can learn to, gradually learn to express their need for soothing without a peak of cortisol. In humans, by the time we are 12 to 18 months, babies will cry just as much on physical examination as they would have done a few months before, but you won't see that peak of cortisol, which shows that they're starting to kind of burn their own stress responses. But children who are insecurely attached or who are just temperamentally inhibited, shy children, you may still see a peak of cortisol. So it can take those children a bit longer to develop those um, stress responses. And it's been shown that, again, from Megan Gunner's group, that high quality maternal behaviour. That's not to say it's just mothers, just that that's just to say for sure this is also true of parental behaviour, behaviour of dads, behaviours of grands. Um, if it's high quality, in other words, sensitive, then you'll get better recovery of your cortisol when you get out of the bath every day. None of us like getting out of the bath on a cold day, that's strange. Mary Dozier, who's a fantastic researcher in this field, has done research with children who've experienced abuse and neglect. And sometimes they can have a high flat cortisol pattern. So they seem to not have that lovely diurnal alarm clock. And they also may have problems signaling their needs. So even if they're feeling stressed, you wouldn't necessarily know that they're stressed. So how do most of us develop our stress responses? Well, it's done in relationships to the people that we love, our intimate relationships. And this is usually mum and dad in nuclear families, um, and it can in extended families, anyone who really has that child's needs in mind. So what might this baby be saying? Well, dad will know better than anyone else because you get to know your own baby, but it might be, uh, uh, excuse me, I, I, I might be um, 
or it might be it's a bit hot in here, dad, or whatever. Attachment is a fundamental human instinct, and this was what John Bowlby really explained. Um, he took time out to observe animal behaviour, and he believed that we were most adapted to being hunter-gatherers. And so, if you imagine us walking across the plain with our tribe um, in the hunter-gatherer times, then if a young infant got separated from the herd, they would be in danger of being eaten unless they could signal. So crying, reaching out to be picked up, once you're mobile, actually running after your tribe is a really important safety instinct. And humans do it without even thinking. It doesn't have to go up to the cortex. It's just something that happens. It works across all species. Apparently, you can see it in amoeba. If you put some toxin at the edge of the petri dish, they all clump. So strength in numbers is a fundamental animal thing. So when a young infant is stressed, he or she seeks comfort. And when they get comfort, then this allows those stress hormones to, to stay within safe levels for the brain. Because we know that cortisol in very high levels is actually toxic for brain cells. And it keeps us close to our herd and keeps us safe from predators. Then, importantly for humans, our herd introduces us to our world. So we learn those kind of important social codes um, and what makes us part of our group through those early relationships with our intimate um, group. And when you're young, part of that intimate group is your teacher. Um, and these attachment behaviours happen, happen in the classroom too. And how we respond to children's attachment behaviours is important. But what's perhaps even more important, particularly for children who've experienced diversity, is how they signal their needs. So comfort seeking is essential for development. It's essential for safety. We really can't fulfil our developmental potential without it. And comfort seeking in babies involves noise or movement. And I am going to illustrate that in a moment. Just before I do, one of my most respected colleagues is Suzanne McCree. She's a clinical nurse specialist who's got many years experience with looked after and accommodated children. And she once said in a meeting that in her view, failure to seek comfort is the most important symptom to look for in any abused and neglected child at any age. So I am going to show you, I'm gonna change my share for a minute, this video that I mentioned. And you can go and have a look at this video yourself. It's um, probably about 20 minutes long, but I'm just going to show you a little moment from it. Just to illustrate um, what I'm Helen, saying. Helen, yeah. sorry, can I just um, say for a second, we've got a little issue with the sound. I'm not sure whether it's just a volume issue, but your, your voice is coming and going. Just, I just thought it would... So I don't know whether it's just a question of... Um, a little bit more volume. Ooh, sorry to hear, sorry about that. If necessary, what we could even do is record the lecture, but again at a later date, and post mm -hmm. it if if it's really been a problem. Um, I think I think most of it was fine. It was just a, a wee bit there, so I thought it would just make you. Oh, it's disappearing. We're just having a, a message there, so I think it's coming in and out. So we're getting most of sorry it. About that. Um, hopefully. Um, Hopefully, if necessary, we can rectify that later. Um, mm -hmm. It might just be an internet thing. So we'll press on and let's mm -hmm. hope that uh, we can get this to work. Now, I am going to put a new share on the screen. Right, I'm just going to move this on a little bit. This is a strange situation procedure, which is the test that you use to measure attachment in young infants. Hopefully you can see that. She'll survive. The key 
key moment in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in a toy. Now she has a contact with the mother. She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment. And shortly, she'll be right back with the toy for this time. But you would call this a secure one. Yes. So I'm going to put a new share on and get back to the slides for a moment. Hopefully that's going to work. What you see on that uh, on that clip is just how noisy and upsetting optimal attachment behaviour is, because young infants are primed to tell us when they have a problem, and. There's a fantastic organisation called the Centre on the Developing Child in the States that have developed these metaphors just to remind us what we're looking for in optimal parent-child interaction. And we're looking for serve and return. But it's the infant or the child who should be serving and we follow when things are going well. And what can go wrong is children, who, particularly who've experienced a lot of adversity, may not seek comfort. Or they may do it in a slightly unusual way. They may miscue. And you may also see what we call hypervigilance, where children are very anxious or can be even frozen. And of course, in the classroom, that can be quite a behaviour. But if you notice that as a teacher, then what can help is what we call gentle challenge, which is a bit like being a horse whisperer. You have to kind of gently warm the child up. So you've got to be just a little bit intrusive and, and just gently try and help them. Um, ask for what they need. Um, e well, get what they need, even if they're not asking for it. And um, many of you will be will be very good at that. Back to that old Yerkes Dodson curve. How then would we nudge children back into the optimum? Um, well. What I like to say is pay attention to the silence. Notice children who aren't asking for help. Notice children who are withdrawn. Um, I want to just show you another short clip, nearly at the end of the presentation, but I just want to highlight, bear with me a second, then I'll put a new share on. Um, So notice the difference is avoiding he's not engaging her and it's not being, the reunion's not affecting her. It's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re her return should be the solution to his problem. Oh, I was going on a little bit too far actually, sorry. Now, Maybe and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's in low key. So you would call this insecure. Yes. Insecure is a whole. So in a classroom situation, it's sometimes those children who aren't asking for help who actually are the ones with the problems. Um, and many teachers, I think, are very good at, um, teachers that I've spoken to, are very good at recognising this. So really, um, just to kind of pull this together, pay attention to the silence. So remember that attachment behaviour is there for a range of very important reasons. If you don't exhibit it, you don't learn much. And you don't stay engaged. So have a think about how can you notice failure to seek comfort in the classroom and what might you do about it? Of course, what you're probably more, um, more used to having to deal with is children who act out in the classroom and sometimes that can also be because of stress but often they do they are thought about and we have good strategies for those which is why i'm really asking you to focus on those those withdrawn children so that's really all i want to say um back over to don i think um, and to you and it would be really great to get your questions 
Thank you very much, Helen. That was a, a great introduction to um, to ACEs and uh, to that uh, to, to attachment difficulties. So we're I think we did have a few issues with sound coming in and out there. So um, a couple of suggestions, maybe being closer to the microphone, but I think it might be something to do with the internet, unfortunately. Um, so if um any of our participants have any questions just now if you'd like to type them into the q a box or the chat box and we'll just um address those so i can see a question just come in oh so thank you for a uh, an interesting talk okay and um okay so a question here um, from Leslie, who has read a bit about attachment and um, being proactive in supporting children without them having to seek help first. Um, it seems to be important in building trust. Um, so the, uh, there's a, um, I'm not sure if I've read that correctly because it doesn't sound like, I'm not sure if that's more of an observation than a question. Well, I think it, I think it's a really important observation. I think that's exactly right because it's, it's, um, it's these tiny little micro interactions that help children build trust. And one of the things that's a real challenge um, for teachers and also for foster carers and adoptive parents or birth parents who've had problems um, in, their, in their lives with their children, but they're now getting it on track. It can be really difficult if children are not asking for help and aren't signaling their needs because then it's like it's that back to that serve and return if the child isn't serving then there's no rally and so does the parent or the teacher serve it's a challenge and i think what you have to do is serve gently and that gradually builds trust because children begin to realize that that there's a point of that human interaction Okay, thank you. Lots of questions coming in now very quickly. So I'll try and do them justice because some are coming in on chat and some are coming in on uh, question and answer. So, um, so uh, where are we? Um, yeah, there's a, a question here about um, faulty signaling. Um, you mentioned faulty signaling by children. How do you think that would present in the classroom? Mm -hmm. What you it really is the silence. It's um, it's a child. It would be a child who <clears throat> routinely doesn't ask for help. You know, all of us can decide we're going to get on with it sometimes. But if there's a child who, and sometimes what can happen is you can have a child who kind of keeps pressure on themselves, doesn't ask for help, doesn't have to ask for help, and then bleh, there's an outburst, um, and you wonder whether that child if they'd known how to express their feelings earlier, might not have got to that stage, stage of, of too much arousal. Um, or it can just be a child who's withdrawn and just, it's almost as if they're trying to be invisible. Um, and they really, you know, you get the sense as a teacher that they need warmed up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and so um, there's a question here from Hazel, just about what type of strategies um, can you put in place for an older child who has suffered attachment issues in, in early childhood? So I've actually um, done some workshops with teachers and they've given, you know, they've offered some really helpful tips and it's going to be specific to that child. So um, I, I mentioned that sense of being, a, almost being like a horse whisperer, you've got to be gentle. Um, I'm not saying be gentle when there are chairs flying, you know, that's not to not use your usual limit setting discipline. But in those quiet moments, be gentle. Um, I once um, heard uh, a teacher in a behaviour support base mm -hmm. talking about a particular child with these really major signalling problems. And she literally um, learned to always make sure that she gently opened the door on the way to the base and that child would go first. So it's, it's just really trying to kind of gently lead the child. Um, it really is just noticing the quiet ones, I think, and then you'll develop your own strategies. But as I would say, just it, it, that's not, um, that doesn't mean that you've always got to be 
um, quite gentle if, if you've got to use the, the um, limit setting as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and there's a question here that I think probably quite a lot of us um, are hoping to answer at the moment, and that's um, advice. Can you give any advice to mainstream teachers um, about the return post COVID-19 for both staff and pupils? I mean, it has been obviously such an extreme situation and who knows how, how people will feel on the other side of it. So. So we've been doing um, interviews with families actually to try and understand how the lockdown's been affecting people and what we've heard is that some families have been really enjoying time together um, and some families have been having a much much more stressful time and one of the things that seems to be important is the child's kind of neurodevelopmental profile so children who have autism or ADHD or or even kind of undiagnosed kind of neurodevelopmental features. Um, some of those children, if, particularly if they love routine, um, they've just slotted right into the change and they've slotted right into the routine, but many others have really struggled with the change. And um, what parents have noticed is a kind of recurrence of old, um, more immature behaviours, um, temper tantrums, um, difficulty getting children to do work and things like that. I suspect that it's going to be another change again um, coming back to the school and so I think what I, would, what I would suggest is that we all are compassionate towards ourselves. It's going to be a difficult time. Um, I think it would be really helpful for teachers not to expect too, too much in terms of educational productivity for children in the first week or two. Um, we're, we're all going to need a bit of time just to get to know one another again get used to those old routines and maybe so so maybe building in a bit of time in the day just for some relaxed activities and, and children just just having a bit of time to kind of talk about what it's been like and what it's like coming back might be helpful rather than trying to get straight back into the same um, level of work okay thanks very much uh now um just scrolling down here because um, so the question here from uh, oh, doesn't say who it's from. So at what age can you recognize um, uh, what age can you recognize another child being withdrawn or now I'm not sure because it says CHN so I'm assuming it says at what age can a child recognize another child being withdrawn or sense that something is maybe not quite right in another child's life? Well I think it really depends on the child and some tiny children are really good at this um, and I think it is something that teachers can encourage even at the, at the nursery and early years stage is just that um, those, those tried and tested sharing is caring and, and helping children to kind of bring children out of their shell a little bit. Um, one thing I haven't talked about today is neurodevelopmental problems, but it's really important for teachers to, to remember that just because a child has these signalling problems doesn't mean they don't also have other problems. And actually children who have experienced a lot of adversity are more likely than other children to also have these kinds of problems like ADHD and autism. So I think if you have a sense as a teacher that there's something else going on as well, then do push for that child to have an assessment because you may well be right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And so question here, we've got loads of questions here. So you're going to be very busy, Helen. Um, so question from Hazel, who works in uh, with a nurture group in a secondary school and is asking, um, can you overcome this attachment difficulty by the time children reach secondary or does it work much better earlier? Absolutely. Now you can get over these signaling problems at any age and I think that's a really important message. Children who have these se severe signaling problems um, and who are not good at expressing their needs often also have other developmental problems. So sorting them out in secondary school will be helpful, but there may still be other things to address. And these things are always easier to address sooner. 
rather than later, but they absolutely can be addressed later, even in adulthood. Okay, thanks. And um, so a question here about toxic stress and whether toxic stress is, is linked to attachment and ACEs or ACEs or both and what's the best way to support this? So I would say yes and no. Um, toxic stress is um, really when you're on that you've gone over the hill of the Yerkes Dodson curve and it's chronic you know when you're in that kind of state of high alert. And certainly um, I, there's no doubt in my mind that if you have attachment difficulties and if you've had a big big load of early adversity then you're going to be at higher risk of that. So there's a link but people who haven't had lots of early ad adversity can also experience toxic stress and it's the kind of thing you can also see um, you know, I bet there'll be quite a bit of toxic stress in people who haven't experienced early adversity with the, with the lockdown, because if you're the kind of person who really struggles, um, you know, with a change of routine, or if you've got strained family relationships and it's going to go on for weeks and weeks, then any of us could experience toxic stress. And, you know, mm -hmm. the symptoms are going to be things like sleep problems, going off your food, just having that kind of horrible kind of antsy you, know, you feel like a rodent you feel like a meerkat um and it, i think for all of us if we feel like that then um exercise is a great is a great way to get yourself back over the other side of the toxic stress of the yerts dodson curve talking to people that you love and um, trying to engage in, in things that you enjoy it could be anything from a next a netflix box set to running on the spot anything that burns off that excess adrenaline and gets you back over the hump that you're kind of people. Mm -hmm. Great. So lots and lots of questions still here. Thanks. Um, now, the question here just about the, the gentle approach that you mentioned, um, gentle approach to failure to seek comfort and just a request of whether you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's such an important question and I think the best example is if you imagine um, I often work with foster families, and this happens a lot in foster families. You have maybe a two-year-old who's who just seems fine, doesn't seem particularly unhappy, but maybe comes in with a skinned knee, but doesn't draw anyone's attention to it. A really good example of gentle challenge would be you would notice that, and you would gently try to get the child to notice it, and gently try to get the child to accept some comfort. Because often these children who don't seek comfort are also not very good at accepting it. So you might you might sort of say, oh, honey, look, you've got a sore knee. Come over, come on, honey, come on. And what you might find with some of these children is they'll be like this. And what you're having to try and do is just gently get them to notice it. And it might take many, many attempts. Um, and I've seen some foster carers do this instinctively. And when you see it, it's just like, and teachers, it's just crazy actually trying to get a child used to the benefits of reaching out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I'm going between two, two question streams here. <laughs> um, so uh, how, here's an interesting question. Um, how do you build trust in a child who believes they weren't wanted? So the amazing thing about attachment is it's a really powerful human instinct. And in young children, with literally within weeks, and Mary Dozier has shown this, if a foster carer, for example, um, this hasn't been shown with teachers, but I, I, there's no reason why this shouldn't be true of a teacher either. Um, but with foster carers, if, if the, the foster carer engages in this gentle challenge, then literally within weeks, the child can have a secure attachment, regardless of the degree of abuse and neglect that's happened before. So we're primed to develop these instinctive behaviours and seek care, so it can really melt away very, very quickly. Okay, um, and so you have actually touched on this um, already. I think there was a question about um, ASD and whether that has a big impact on attachment. Is that a major feature? Or? So ASD is really interesting because more than half 
all children with ASD will be securely attached, which means, again, it just shows that we're primed as humans to have a secure attachment. I should say that in the general population, the people who don't have ASD, 60 to 70% 60 to will have a secure attachment and the rest of us will have an insecure attachment with our, with our mums in, uh, you know, in, to in toddlerhood. So, so ASD, I think, makes secure attachment a bit more challenging, but only a bit more challenging. And what we notice with children with autism is that they do signal their needs. They just might do it in an unusual way. So they might walk backwards towards their parent or the teacher. Um, they might lean you know, and they might, they might look, but without eye contact. But what you'll still see is, and it's this fundamental thing that John Bowlby talked about, is proximity seeking. So they'll still have ways of either pulling an adult towards them or moving themselves towards an adult. We just might do it in funny ways. So it's a bit more challenging to notice those signaling behaviours, but they'll be mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Um... Ah, no, this is a, a really uh, topical one. As a nurture teacher, how best can I support my pupils with attachment disorder during these times when I can't see them? That is a really difficult one. Yeah, it's a really, really difficult one. And I think we've been talking a lot about this in our team. Um, I think it really, you've really got to try and be flexible with the types of communication that those children are used to. Children with ASD, for example, and some of the children in nurture groups who've had a history of trauma will also have either a diagnosis of ASD or symptom. Children with ASD often find new forms of communication quite difficult. So they may really struggle with Zoom. I've got a colleague who um, has a son with ASD, for example, and um, she did a lovely thing. She actually told her child a social story about there was this virus that came along and we had to use new ways to, to communicate. And that seemed to work with him. So what I would say is as a nurture teacher, you'll know those children, you'll have a sense of what they're good at in terms of communication and you're gonna to have to think laterally and be, and be flexible. You may have to communicate with them through their parents. Some of them it may work well using video, WhatsApp, you know, Microsoft Teams, others. It's going to have to be sending messages to them. But I think the big thing is let them know that you still care about them and that you're there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so we're almost at the bottom of the Q&A questions, but we still have more on the chat. So I'm <laughs> just um, working my way down here. Um, so how can I help a children whom I know has attachment issues? He insists all the time he's fine, but it's clear through his behaviour that he isn't. So it's really, it's just that gentle challenge. And I think a child like that who is going to say, I am fine, it's not going to be helpful to say, no, you're not, because then you'll just be in a conflict. But I think it is just a case of trying to notice opportunities to help. Um, and so that hopefully, gradually, that young person will begin to see the benefits of asking for help. Sometimes it can be helpful to name emotions. So... Um, <coughs> Excuse me, this is asthma, not COVID, by the way, in case anyone's worried. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if, for example, you can see a child getting kind of pink and sweaty or whatever, you might, if you know that child well enough, be able to say something like, you're looking a bit stressed to me, uh, maybe I could help. So I think just you, try and use your in intuition and, and, and just try and notice before that child gets over the hump of the ex-person curve. Mm -hmm. Okay, great stuff. And um, so the question here to, um, about um, some additional reading. Uh, so what would you recommend in addition to attachment theory by Bowlby and Ainsworth, um, etc, that could help me in my role as pupil support officer? Um, particularly like your input, re children who are quiet, but can also be in distress. So is there any particular reading there that would... That's... Gosh, you know, you put me on the spot there. Um, I mean, it depends whether you want kind of hard-nosed science. And if you do, then I would recommend to read um, studies by Pascal Firon. Um, I can maybe give Don the, the name. Mm -hmm. 
um, and also uh, Mary Dozier. If you're wanting, so, let me have a think about that and we can maybe post mm -hmm. this can... on the website because there are some really good mm -hmm. books about, about attachment. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. So we can follow that up and put something out um, afterwards. Okay, I think we're on to our last question. So loads of, uh, loads of questions there. Um, but if a child has a chromosome disorder, how do you impact their abilities to form friendships? Oh, someone so working with primary and early years. Such a lovely question. And actually I've got a really specific example. I was lecturing um, in New Zealand a couple of years ago and in the audience, um, there was an occupational therapist who specialised in children who'd been through neonatal intensive care. And she was working with a little girl of seven months and her mum who had a chromosome disorder. And um, this wonderful occupational therapist said to the mum, what are your goals for treatment? And mum, mum said, all I would like is to be able, for her to be able to give me a hug. And, you know, that's basic attachment behaviour. So from seven, eight, nine months, infants should be able to reach out, get a hug and signal that they, that they want it. And, you know, it took several months of intensive work until that little girl could just lean her head on her mum's shoulders. And it's such a good question, really, to, to finish with, because it just reminds us that children with physical and learning disabilities, they, they have the same need to signal the needs. They have the same needs and the same instincts for attachment. But their physical and learning limitations might get in the way. And so it's just, it just shows that the, the task of parenting isn't the same for every parent some parents are going to have to work that bit harder and if you're a parent of a child with a disability you're going to have to work a lot harder just to be able to have that basic attachment with with your child but it's possible mm -hmm. thank you so much helen we've really uh, put you to the test there this afternoon with such a, a wide range of questions but uh, that's been absolutely fantastic i'm just checking very quickly before i <laughs> click uh, that there aren't any more coming in but uh, lots of thank yous coming up on screen so um, that's been really interesting um, this afternoon thank you so much for taking the time um, to share your expertise with us um, for those of you still with us um, the um, this will be put on the website so you'll be able to refer back to it uh, once we've edited and uh, made sure that everything's in good working order. So if you did have any issues with, with the sound, hopefully that will, you'll be able to watch that back. But um, no, that, that was really, uh, really interesting. Uh, so my thanks again from the whole of the, the Shine team to our very special guest, uh, Professor Helen Minnis. And and thank you to, to the audience for, I, I've always really enjoyed talking with teachers because you have such good questions. So thanks for that. <laughs>